Jim, thanks for inviting me and putting this on again. I feel a little bit uncomfortable that this is a project that's in progress. Uh, but I think it's one of the intents of this conference is to you know, inform the partners of what, what we're up to and what the other agencies are up to in the area. So I hope to do that. Uh, I was contracted with for the Fish and Wildlife Service to help them establish a, a long-term monitoring plan for the panthers and the prey and other wildlife on the refuge. And so I extend my appreciation to uh, the refuge staff, Kevin and Larry, and also to the Maple Zoo Conservation Fund, which helped fund the equipment. I get, I, I worry a bit of, of remote remote camera burnout. Uh, there, you know, you, you just can't get away from these days and, and presentations and you, sure enough, especially based on my experience, you know, you can't, you can't walk out in the woods without getting caught by one. So from my experience, be, be cautious of, of when you get comfortable and decide to do things with you. Um, so my intent today is to kind of give you a kind of a brief history of time uh, with the camera work here in South Florida that I've done and kind of place that into context of what we're, we're up to now on, on the Panther Refuge. Uh, the first work I, I did with remote cameras was with FWC back in 99, and it was really looking at this kind of the basic question of how effective was this tool uh, to capture Panthers, and uh, if we were successful in, in capturing them, uh, what kind of data did we get? Was it suitable for incorporation into mark recapture? studies, for example. The uh, long and short of it was, yeah, they're, they're pr pretty easy to catch if you, if you know where to look, uh, but they, they do have some limitations on, on the ability to identify individuals, which, which limit their use in more complex statistical models. Uh, you know, one of the drawbacks or one of the limitations that, that Pumas have is that they lack really any identifiable features other than just anomalies that would normally occur on their body, uh, unlike Jaguar, this Jaguar from Argentina, uh, survey I did a couple of years ago. Um, you know, they have, their spotting pattern is basically a fingerprint. They, they really lend themselves nicely to uh, incorporate into mark recapture studies. Uh, these two Jaguars, when I put these images together, I didn't realize that they are the same, different individuals, and it doesn't take third grader could, could tell you that. Uh, but a lot of the work with, with remote cameras and cats have, have been done with these, you know, spotted and striped cats, ocelots, tigers, uh, jaguars, and a lot of the work was done with, with tigers. And when I finished up that first feasibility study, uh, there was some science that came out that showed that even though all these tiger studies where they were able to estimate the population size based on these mark individuals, that you could look at that capture data and forget the individual marking and just look at the, ca the capture rate, the number of animals that come across the cameras, and it correlated really nicely to density. And in addition to that, you know, they made the point that you could use this to study other unmarked animals in the population, primarily their prey. So that really piqued my interest on the applicability of the panthers. Uh, because, you know, we like to think panthers are our own, but the puma as a species is the widest distributed mammal. Um, and one common, common factor or component that, that binds all puma populations in the, in the Americas is the need for wide open spaces, you know, wild areas and, and large prey on which to feed upon. And again, a third grader can tell you uh, from that image, why panthers are here in Southwest Florida based on the, the wide open spaces, natural areas. But more importantly, um, you know, they need, they need the deer component, and that's the most uh, important indicator of habitat quality that sometimes is, is forgotten. But it's not just a spatial extent, not just the habitat composition, but that prey component. And, you know, this ties in nicely, history can can really help us here because, you know, we, in the 30s, we saw a tremendous prey decline uh, due to the, uh, the eradication efforts to eradicate the 
it, uh, ticks that cause cattle fever. And I think they estimated like 10,000 deer were, were killed in the, in the late 30s, early 40s. Luckily, the Seminoles um, stood their ground and uh, didn't take any from their herd. And also, more recently, you'll hear uh, a little bit uh, later on with Taz's presentation, you know, looking at the potential for hydrological impacts on, on the deer herd and uh, the potential for that to cause an impact on the panther population. So it is important to monitor the prey. But as anybody familiar here who has gone out on the ground, uh, habitats here aren't conducive for spotlight counts. And not all the areas, if you've flown over Fakahatchee or the Panther Refuge, aren't conducive to aerial surveys for, for deer either. So that's where cameras have come in. And so I took that information on the importance of prey as an indicator of habitat quality for panthers and uh, the ability for these cameras to make an improved method to, uh, when I was contracted to do the baseline conditions for the Picking and Strand Restoration Project and use that premise in that previous tiger study that you can use these cameras to not only catch the predator but also the prey too. And that was a pretty intensive study, you know, 98 cameras uh, laid out in Picking and Strand. And again, the type of data we got was, yeah, we got presence absence, but we also got that photographic capture rate, the index of relative abundance of both these species. And then I'll get into a little bit more. You can identify some individual panthers and get kind of a minimum count. After that project was completed, and this is where we're kind of coming into present day, um, I kind of had this, this work peer reviewed by, by some of the experts at Patuxent. The National Wildlife Research Center that kind of wrote the books on camera trapping and modeling uh, capture data. And that work is in progress. Um, we are getting some positive results that even though you, you cannot, you know, you don't have clearly identifiable features for individuals, um, some, of the, some of the individuals you can identify, particularly those cats that are wearing radio collars. And those radio collars provide information on the movement of individual animals so they can incorporate that into the model. So they have developed a, a model especially for, for panthers where they take those identified individuals, incorporate those unmarked animals that are captured also, and they have been able to come up with a, a density estimate that has some level of precision for the site-specific um, population. I, I can't explain it, but it's coming, uh, I promise. <laughs> um, it's been submitted to the Journal of Applied Ecology, so hopefully maybe next year I'll be able to talk a bit about that. Uh, one of the things we'd like to improve in, in building that model is the ability to identify individuals, and even those animals wearing radio collars, um, if, if they're all wearing the same manufactured collar, it's difficult to tell at times. Not all panthers follow the instructions that are given and captured, <laughs> stop, pose, and turn. Uh, so this year, we are going to experiment a little bit with uh, putting some further identification features on, on the collars. Okay, so this is the project now on the, on the Panther Refuge. Again, this is in progress. It's taking all those elements that I just talked about and hoping to establish a long-term monitoring protocol for, for panthers, other wildlife, and, and white-tailed deer. Got about 61 cameras deployed based on kind of the deer home range size. And we have kind of, you know, primarily three objectives. Uh, one, uh, is to establish those long-term protocols, basing, basing it on the work that we've done, some of the refinements that have been made, uh, technological advancements. And again, you know, we'll be able to kind of take the work that has been done and maybe find out how we can improve that model to help estimate panther population size with camera data. And then just as important, as I mentioned earlier, to, you know, to find ways to monitor the deer herd and help the deer herd. And also having such an intensive grid over a long period of time allows us to have the ability to look at the effects of refuge management actions on said species. Uh, this is uh, the type of database that's been set up. We have approximately over like probably 35,000 captures and every 
energy is identified to species, um, especially panthers and deer. I uh, record more specific information on, on the individual sex, age. And what's nice about these uh, cameras that we have now is they also, um, they do have a video feature that, that improves the, the capture data, especially during the day, uh, where you can get, you know, kind of those trailing animals, gives you nice videos, <laughs> <laughs> uh, gives you the all effect. Um, because it is important, you know, you get that initial capture, it's, it's kind of important to get that animal that's trailing behind your, your target species, especially when trying to document reproduction, uh, kitten survival uh, panthers. Uh, this is a good example of, you know, in previous years, that may have been lost, but with the improvement of the technology, um, you know, we do, um, able to get that, those trailing dependent age kittens, which are about ready to disperse, given their size. And again, you know, one of the problems is this, it's hard to identify individual cats if they don't have unique markings or radio collars. Although some cats, I don't know if this, like, you just stick the stick. The collar there, notches in the ears that lend this male to better identification. But the video segment allows, you know, to even see those features even further. The other thing that helps is that, you know, these stations are kind of self-baited. You know, I don't use artificial lure, but I place them where I've seen historically cats marking. Um, and then once a, a panther decides to scrape, it really helps bring in other cats um, and helps, you know, really improve the capture data. He goes on for quite a <laughs> And it's, it's neat to see the different different behavior and, and their reactions of individual panthers. This is all behavior that, that has been documented and recorded, but sometimes it's really neat just to finally finally see it. And you can see how this female with kittens um, reacts to a scrape different than a male would be. A male would answer that scrape uh, with another one on his own, but you can see she's a bit more cautious and is exhibiting the Fleming response, which she's taken in that scent in their filmaral nasal organ on the roof of her mouth and kind of teaching her, her kids to do the same. Uh, another, another behavior that helps us identify individuals, and I think Roy and Rebecca have talked about this at last year's symposium, is claw raking. Um, contrary to the assumption or most people have, is they're not sharpening their claws on, on these logs, but they are kind of removing their, their claw sheets um, so to speak, and also leaving a visual mark for other panthers to see and lay down scent. Uh, this is a good example here. Yeah. They begin cheek rubbing. They have, they do have glands in their cheeks, but they leave scent. So a lot of this is just kind of, you know, it, it is gee whiz and it, it's cool stuff to, to see, uh, but it does help us, you know, kind of shine a light on some of the behavior attributes of these, uh, of these cats. <coughs> yeah, he, he worked it for quite a while. Leaves a scent. This helps bring a female. You know, it doesn't bring them from, from far away, but it helps those cats that are moving on the trails stop and pause. Notice the difference between the female and the last shot, who, you know, they both Fleming, but this cat, uh, will will advertise her presence, and that's the way females do. They advertise that they're in estrus and ready to breed. So you'll see her deposit a bit of urine at the end. And then the other the other resident male comes by and uh, takes it in that scent and leaves his own. You'll see him lick. Neat stuff. Uh, word got out about the, the Rock Island massage parlor. Yeah. <laughs> 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 got some bad stuff going on there. 
you know, methods for both the deer and the panther are, are critical because the, the deer will be forever tied to the panther. And uh, if we can improve the science, uh, I think we'll be, we'll be better off for future recovery efforts. So that's it. Thank you.